And the cattails, um, since we sprayed with for the Phragmites in 2018, they've really flourished around the edges of our water bodies. Tremendous though, and the cattail is a preferred water uh, marsh species that we want there. Well, I think with this dry period, the cattails have started to move out across the, the whole pond. And cattails grow in, you know, water a foot or 25 centimeters uh, deep easily. They form a mat. And I'm wondering whether next summer, instead of having a six acre pond with cattails around the edge, as to whether we're going to have a six acre marsh with cattails dotted throughout it. Um, if that happens, there will be a tremendous amount of edge um, in that marsh, which will be very beneficial to birds and other wildlife. Um, there will be a little bit of drawback in that when the birds are on the pond, uh, for the bird watchers, the bird watchers are going to have to work a little harder because there's going to be visual barriers in that pond. And what's happening in this pond uh, is sort of what draws a lot of excitement from me uh, about this property in that, you know, in 2000, this was an active, so 20 years ago, this was an active lagoon property. And then in the early 2000s, uh, the, ponds, the, the lagoons were decommissioned and um, about five or six acres of upland land, uh, upland was covered with uh, almost a foot of clay from one of the ponds. And uh, so this whole landscape 14 years ago was pretty sterile. And then we've been watching the changes over that 14 years and in no way as it become uh, stabilized yet because plant communities are changing by day and as plant communities change so do the animal species whether you're talking insects um, mice birds amphibians uh, they change with them i mean this year uh, uh, one pond just to the west of the observation tower had a uh, had a large number of bullfrogs in it i don't know where they came from because I don't know where else in Grimsby you can find bullfrogs, but they're there in good numbers. Uh, Virginia rails, you know, I always thought it was a hard bird to find. Well, this year at this pond, at the Watcher's Pond, uh, anybody could see them. They were out uh, having picnics in the sunshine in the shallow water with, with the young. I think we had three or four families of Virginia rails. Wow. So, so um, we're, we're seeing things change, and those changes I don't think are going to stop uh, ever um, because this is a, it's a dynamic uh, property, and I, I, myself, Lori, and others who have been involved with us uh, on the property, um, we uh, have enjoyed the opportunity of working on land that's owned by the region of Niagara, um, and uh, doing all these fun projects. I hope to have another article in the Wood Duck uh, late winter, early spring um, about what we've done this year. I'd just like to give a, a shout out to the uh, Ed Smee Fund from the Conserver Society of Hamilton. They were generous with us at the beginning of the year with a grant. And then uh, the Lois Evans uh, Natural Heritage Fund from the Hamilton Community Foundation at the end, of, towards the end of this year, brought wonderful news to us with another, no, another significant uh, contribution for, uh, financially to our work at the Grimsby Wetlands. Um, so this year, some of the highlights of our work uh, was a uh, child art display wall that we've, uh, we have up. We hope people come down and see it. We've just completed our snake uh, hibernaculum um, on the property. And um, this year, our 
let's see, our purple martin nesting box we put up late last summer uh, was successful. We had one brood fledge, four nests started, one brood fledge. So we're hoping we have a new colony of purple martins in the beginning. And our barn swallows successfully nested this year in our barn swallow nesting structure and still deers were frolicking a lot in our artificial kill deer spotted sandpiper nesting uh, beach that created. Uh, I'm not sure where they nested, but we know where they copulated. They love it. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Hey, that's all right. That's that's incredible. Congratulations on uh, being successful in, in some future grants and the hard work that Lori and yourself and others have put into it. And um, I guess I, I wanted to know um, before we let you go is what 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 is exciting to you for 2021 with this project? I mean, like you mentioned, the new the newer establishing plant communities might bring something new for 2021. But is there anything else that you think is is ex something that you're looking forward to with this location next year? Um, well, I got it. My big wish is the uh, to be start communicating with the federal government and the Department of National Defense. They own, uh, the Department of National Defense owns the Nine Pond on the north end of the property. It has tremendous potential. And since 2006, uh, nothing's been done with property. The pond is ringed with Phragmites and wild parsnip, uh, which is a toxic plant. Um, and quite rare in our area, but wow, we have it at the Grimsby wetlands. Thanks, whoever brought those seeds in. Um, uh, the uh, I'm blaming a duck, but any um, I was starting just starting communication this year, and COVID hit. So I just said, no sense trying to get into uh, communicating with the federal government when it was a period of difficulty for everybody. The pond can wait. Um, so in 2021, if we can start to establish a relationship with the Department of National Defense and see if they can bring some environmental stewardship to their pond, uh, at least in terms of, before I kick me out, I'd like to thank all the people that have come down to enjoy the area, uh, the birders and naturalists come from far and wide, shared their photographs and shared their and this is really a to us we go to communicate with uh, government agencies or, or apply for grants or go to groups or uh, and good luck in 2021. Let us know how we can help persuade the federal government. And even if it is to just get the Bruce and Lori helipad somewhere put in the in that area so that you can be flying a helicopter to and from right. bring locations. We'll, I haven't we'll try for that. That's maybe for 2025, Jackson, but I'll do it. Okay, Bruce, um, any final messages before we let you go? Just everybody have a safe and worry-free 2021 and do whatever is best for you over the over the Christmas period. This is these are different times. I don't need to say it, but looking forward to seeing everybody out in 2021. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bruce and Lori. Enjoy the talk tonight, and we'll connect again soon. Thanks, Jackson. No problem. All right. Thank you, Bruce. There's been a lot of birding activity in the area as of late. If you've been keeping in touch with Discord or with the various listservs. Um, whether it's a Pacific loon, snowy owls, various geese, 
hundreds of sandhill cranes were passing over the other day. Um, funnily enough, after last month's session with Tyler Hoare, all about winter finches, red crossbills showed up the next day. Um, White-winged crossbills, evening grosbeaks, pine grosbeaks, these are still making appearances in the HSA. A northern perula is also um, a bit of a head scratcher, but is kicking around, which is amazing. Um, I reached out to Mark Peck to talk about his annual specimen collection. So that is going to occur next BSG session, Monday, January 18th, being at the Nature Interpretive Center of the Royal Botanical Gardens Arboretum. And the place is kind of designed that you can drive in, do a bit of a loop around and come back as if you're going to leave. And there he will be waiting with coolers that people can just drop their specimens into. Um, it is asked that I guess you put the date you collected it and where you collected the specimen. And if you can ID it, great. Um, regardless, he will take those collections back to the ROM with him. So that is Monday, January 18th. And he'll be there from 5 until 7 p.m. Um, and again, it'll get you home just in time to catch the 7.30 BSG meeting. Also in the meantime um, is the 100th annual Christmas bird count. So in its 100th year, it's happening on December 26th, which <laughs> I didn't even put the date down here, silly me. Boxing Day, um, Rob Porter is the compiler and coordinator. And so hamilton.bird.count at gmail.com if you wish to um, volunteer for that day. You can be a beginner, intermediate, or expert birder. Any counter would be, would be fantastic. And then on January 3rd, um, going back to Bruce McKenzie there, um, is the peach tree count, which is, is relatively new, and it's kind of the Grimsby area, just a little bit outside of the HSA, but you can contact Chris Motherwell or president at hamiltonnature.org if you want to sign up for that. Any and all birders are welcome for both of those, and you can contribute to that community science programming. Um, we talk every month about different resources that exist out there, and so um, Rob Porter mentioned just in the last slide has been uploading quite a few different episodes of his songbirding podcast. So he's working tirelessly on that, which is great. If you are wanting to learn a little bit more um, and you are a bit more digitally savvy and you're looking to get more up to date, up to the minute, up to the second um, postings um, of bird sightings, you can download the Discord app. There is a Hamilton Naturalist Club um, thread as well as an Ontario Birds thread. Of course, there are the listservs through the Google groups, and so you can, there's no shortage of any um, and any of these resources out there for you. But what we would hope is that people would become members of the Hamilton Naturalist Club, and it it costs I think forty five bucks for a single, fifty bucks for a family, forty dollars for a senior, um, and you would be joining the ranks of the Hamilton Naturalist Club. You would get monthly publications of the wood ducks, but um, of course that 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 money goes towards um, towards the club as a whole and towards all of the work that we do at our various nature sanctuaries. If you would like to volunteer with the HNC, you can do so by contacting volunteer at hamiltonnature.org. Um, and if you want to become a member, membership at hamiltonnature.org. And you can always reach out to me, bird study group at Hamilton Nature. I'm happy to connect with. And to be a dual hosting session with Mike Haddon and Rob Dobo to talk all about the Ontario Breeding Atlas 3. So looking for volunteers, looking for birders, looking for people that are going to be able to help contribute to this um, epic project. And if you're wanting to learn more about it or the history of it, you can um, check out that particular meeting. Now, without further ado, eight o'clock on the dot. So almost three decades ago, Michael Mazur rescued a common yellow throat from a building collision. And while en route to, a, to rehab the bird, it escaped from the paper bag inside his car, perched on the rear view mirror and began to sing. As Michael continued to drive, enchanted apps dead on his lap many other people to kind of bring awareness to 
window collisions and formed the Fatal Light Awareness Program or FLAP Canada and here to tell us all about it and through no applause but uproarious applause from the people at home everybody let's welcome Michael Mazur to the VSG thank you very much Michael take it away thank you very much I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me I'm gonna get myself I'm off mute now that's great and what I'm going to do just before switching to uh, share screen mode, just everyone should know I am on a satellite connectivity for internet. The bandwidth is terrible, so it helps by me just turning off my video and I'll just let the uh, desktop tell the story. So I'm going to turn off my video right now and switch to the share screen mode and find my presentation. And we can start, I hope, if I can get to the setting. Oh my goodness. One second. Here we go. I'll get there. All right. Um, let me just go back one more here for whatever reason we got that stuff happening. Here we go. As was mentioned, uh, was formed in 1993. We were originally uh, an organization that focused primarily, if not entirely, on educating the public about the, the bird collision issue with lit structures in the city of Toronto. Um, since then, we've evolved into the larger scope of the issue, which includes both nighttime and daytime collisions. Statistically speaking, daytime collisions is far more lethal than the nighttime collision is, issue is. Um, not to dismiss the nighttime, and I'll go into the differences in this presentation, but we're well above and beyond now uh, from the grassroots approach of rescue and rehabilitation. Uh, we, we're taking on all kinds of program activities now, and one of our primary focuses is guidelines, policies, and standards development. Um, across the province and across the country for that matter. Uh, we have, have other programs uh, like the other ones mentioned at the bottom of the screen here, but we're finding that the bulk of our effort is in the guidelines and policy and standards development section because this is where we stand to save the most birds lives. And I'll get into some of that detail later on as well. Now one of the, one of the main uh, annual activities that we take on is an annual bird layout, which for the longest time has been at the Royal Ontario Museum. This image captures an example of this layout. Uh, it, it shows the samples of, uh, of the birds that didn't make it, that our volunteers picked up from just a handful of buildings in and around the Toronto regions. It's very, very important to understand that the birds that we pick up aren't those birds that for the average individual that they're familiar with, like the Canada goose or the house sparrow or the robin. These are species of birds that are just passing through our region over a very short period of time. And they're just totally unfamiliar with the built environment. And this is in part why these birds um, are more vulnerable to collisions than others. Our volunteers go out uh, both pre-dawn patrols and post-dawn patrols. We start as early as midnight on some busy nights of migration, and we will keep going in different uh, rotations until well into the afternoon that given day. Um, we can pick up no birds in a given round. We can pick up hundreds of birds in a given round. Uh, every day is a surprise, and, but that being said, the bulk of our activity, again, is in terms of bird rescue is during the migration seasons. So we patrol the base of these structures, looking for whatever birds we can at the base of the, of the uh, sidewalks surrounding these buildings. We document each and every one of these birds uh, into, a, into a database. We try to identify any obvious signs of trauma. In this case, you're looking at a, a northern flicker that has beak damage. Um, there are various forms of trauma from feather damage to uh, sometimes even broken bones, but the most common injury is head trauma. And you can just imagine for a bird slamming into a panel of glass would be just like you and I running into a brick wall, a head first. So head trauma, it's no surprise that, that this is the common cause of injury. 
Uh, any live birds, they're housed in individual paper bags. We uh, find uh, our packs of our vehicles sometimes filling up with individual paper bags, each containing a bird. We take these birds to some natural areas outside of the financial district, away from buildings as much as possible so that we at least hope they won't encounter uh, a structure again, at least in the immediate area where we found those birds. And then those birds that are ready to be released, we go into uh, natural areas and, and let them go. Um, we, we do find occasionally a bird may find itself popping out of the cardboard box or paper bag that it's in, but it doesn't demonstrate the ability to fly properly. We'll keep recapture those birds and take those birds to the wildlife rehabilitation facilities. Most notably in the Toronto region, it would be the Toronto Wildlife Centre. Any of the dead birds, uh, funny enough, the uh, specimens that Mark Peck might very well show you are birds that our volunteers have picked up. We have donated thousands of specimens to the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, they go into their exhibits right there in the museum itself. They're traded with other museums around the world. Uh, they're used for research purposes like wind turbine studies, scavenging rate studies. So no bird that we pick up will go to waste, even though it unfortunately had to perish from those strikes. The birds that we pick up, as I mentioned, so they're not Canada geese or house sparrows or robins. Uh, these are birds that for, for those that aren't avid birders may not even know some of these birds exist. The white-throated sparrows, uh, the oven bird, and the, the ruby-throated hummingbird, the ruby-throated hummingbird being more familiar to the average person, um, are up there as the more common species that we encounter. Um, some of the listed species we pick up are birds like the Canada warbler, the whippoorwill, and the wood thrush. The migratory uh, corridors, uh, as most of you may very well know, when, the, when you uh, try to talk with people about migration and the migration routes they take, and the term corridor, it, it conjures up an image in one's mind that these are very tight highways that these birds follow. But technically speaking, the entire continent of North America is one massive migratory corridor, and they're made up of four different migratory corridors. What makes Toronto unique in terms of uh, being more susceptible to collisions than others are things like two overlapping corridors, the Atlantic and the Mississippi corridor overlap over the Toronto region, plus the fact that we sit up against a large body of water, and that body of water isn't like the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. It's a relatively small body, water, body of water in comparison, but the birds still, when they hit the shorelines of these large bodies of water, they try to decide if they're going to fly over that large body or around, follow the shoreline around that lake. And so all this heavy concentration of birds end up landing in and around the Toronto region as a result of these factors. Now, the other important thing to re realize when it comes to bird collisions, again, in, in one's mind, they picture these massive high rises as the bad guy. These are where all the birds are dying. Well, statistically speaking, the vast majority of birds that are colliding with windows during the day occur up to the top of the mature tree canopies in and around that given structure. The average height of a mature tree canopy for the Toronto region is between 16 to 20 meters. And this is simply because the birds, they, they migrated throughout the night, they've fallen out into some natural areas. Toronto has an abundance of natural habitat that these birds gravitate to and fall out into. You get a high concentration of birds in these tree canopies, and they're moving through the tree canopy, gobbling up insects, perhaps eating seeds and um, fruits in those trees. And as they move from one tree to the next, the next tree they're flying toward is in fact a reflection of the tree they just left. So you have all this high concentration of birds that are occurring in, within the first four to five stories of a given structure. Above and beyond that, those collisions tend to be few and far apart. Now, when you look at architecture today, we continue to have a fact we realized the, the potential to create an envelope around a building while still allowing a natural daylight and a feel for the outdoor environment in, uh, we just became, for lack of a better term, obsessed with glass. And, and these are extreme examples of where architecture has gone, 
but it clearly demonstrates the horrible illusion that an all look like a continuation of the environment itself. Um, architects to this day still gravitate toward designing new structures with glass. And as long as we allow this to happen at the rate that it's done, we are going to continue to have an issue, this case being bird collisions with structures being the leading cause of bird death across Canada. And again, extreme examples, why someone would want to make a picket fence out of mares uh, boggles my mind. But again, I, I, I'm not pretending here to think that this is common. These are extreme examples. So why birds collide with windows? It's somewhat to a point of already what I've mentioned. These windows, whether they're mirrored surfaces or they're transparent glass, they all reflect the surrounding environment in some shape or form. They all, also the transparent qualities of glass give the illusion of a clear passage for the bird to fly through. Whether it's looking through two corners of panels of glass or to an interior space in a building where they might have plants inside or transparent railing systems. Uh, again, can be just as lethal as mirrored glass itself. Now to kind of give you a sobering number here, it's estimated that upwards of 1 billion birds die across North America each year as a result of collisions with windows. To put that into more perspective, that means that up, upwards of close to 32 birds per second die. So during this hour presentation, sorry, in this case, we're calculating, I think, a half hour on the number that you see in the upper right-hand corner, 114,000 birds will die across North America just as a result of collisions. Now, you look at how much attention the Exxon Valdez oil spill had at its time with all the birds that died as a result of that economic or not environmental disaster. What happens with bird collisions is the equivalent of happening 313 times per year. So we really need to pay close attention to this issue if we're serious about preventing birds from dying from here forward. Um, this isn't limited to commercial structures. Homes are right up there statistically. And you'll get into that number in a moment, but our homes, our cottages, our condos and apartments, even bus shelters, our vehicles, wind barriers, and sound barriers, office towers. Any structure with glass has the potential to harm or kill a migratory bird. When it comes to homes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, low to mid-rise structures, which is a, a low to mid-rise structure is anywhere from two to I believe six stories. Then you get into the high rise. Um, that's where a, a large percentage of these birds are dying, but an incredible large number of birds are dying at our homes as well. So we all have a role here to play in preventing this issue from happening. And I can give you some tips on how to deal with that later. With our homes, uh, it's no surprise. Um, a lot of these older homes have mature landscapes around them. These are the very landscapes that birds will gravitate to. Part of the problem is to, not just the windows themselves, but it's, it's what attractants we provide for these birds. And bird feeding is a very, very popular pastime. In fact, it's incredible how many homes will have a bird feeder in their backyard. And why? It's one of those few forms of wildlife that we can all appreciate and enjoy right at our doorstep. We don't have to travel far to appreciate. And the problem is we situate these bird feeders in the worst possible location, which is typically between five to 10 meters of a window. That's what we call the hot zone. We want to place these feeders, in fact, as close as possible to the windows as we can. Um, statistically, a one meter or less is good, ideally right up against the windows themselves, okay? So keep that in mind with your bird feeders. So that being said, how do we make glass visible to birds? Well, you have to, you have to create what, for lack of a better term, what we call visual noise or a visual barrier. We're all most familiar, familiar with the bird of prey decal as a product one can purchase to prevent bird strikes. The bird of prey decal is not what they thought it was designed it would be able to do. They thought it would scare the bird away from the window. Birds, quite frankly, are just not 
stupid. They realize that this is just an object that's breaking up the reflective or transparent qualities of the glass in the immediate area where that decal is adhered. All other surface of that glass remains untreated. The birds can collide with. So you have to put markers on those windows spaced no greater than two inches or five centimeters apart horizontally or four inches or 10 centimeters apart vertically. Ideally, five centimeters or two inches apart vertically is better because the birds that the, the research did on determining these measurements were birds larger than a chickadee, chickadee or, or larger size. But if you think about it, some of the most vulnerable species we pick up that collide with windows, like I said, are the ruby-throated hummingbird, the brown creeper, the ruby-crowned and golden-crowned kinglet. These birds can slip through smaller spaces. So industry, uh, government agencies, non-for-profits focusing on this issue are going to what we call the two inch by two inch or five by five centimeter rule. Now, those markers, can be of any shape, pattern. I'm gonna get into that in a moment. But what's important is the contrast. If you're looking out, if your window is reflecting a dark environment, could be a, a dark forest or an adjacent building. Um, if you put a dark marker on that window, the contrast visual strength is not gonna be strong. So you have to go to a light strength. The extreme would be like a white mark. In this case, we're using, using dots as the example. But if those windows are reflecting sky or open space, a light marker becomes less effective. So you need to go to a dark. Ideally, you want to go what's called a duotone. Go to the light and dark pattern. So regardless of what the light factors are, what that light contrast is, markers will be visible in all lighting variables, okay? Um, patterns can be anything, like I said. In this case, you'll see uh, kind of a a crosshair pattern, um, X patterns, it can be all, any shape, any, any size, any direction you want, as long as that spacing doesn't exceed that five by five centimeter rule, okay? Also, very important, the markers need to be on the outside surface of the glass, or what they call surface one. Here in our climate, we have thermal pane glass. Each of those panels of glass, two of them, have a, a first and second surface. The outside surface of panel one is where you need to place the marker. And here's why. If you have a transparent window, and here's, here you are, you're, you're at a, a certain time of day, <clears throat> excuse me, where you can see directly into that living space. But then as that sunlight changes its angle, shifts itself, say from east to west, um, that transparent glass the first surface of that glass becomes a mirror. So whatever, if you were to place a marker on the inside of your window, that marker becomes useless. So that's why it's so important, I'm just showing you the animation again there, uh, becomes so important that that marker be placed on the outside surface of glass. Here's a perfect example. The Pan Am Aquatic Center in Markham, they treated their windows with a bird deterrent marker. The marker was placed on the inside surface. You can see those markers quite clearly, but the upper row of glass is being shadowed by a, a, a very deep overhang. As a result of that shadow being cast on the glass, the second surface of glass. Very important, remember, outside surface of glass is essential. They also have technologies now that focus on the ultraviolet. Birds can see uh, uh, the majority of the spectrum of the ultraviolet, where we as humans can see very little of it. By placing invisible markers that reflect ultraviolet patterns has demonstrated effectiveness at reducing some bird strikes. However, I'll go into a little bit of detail why that's not working as well as they thought. Here's an example of what the black uh, uh, bird on the right-hand side shows how we perceive that bird the aerodescent bird on the left-hand side is how the birds interpret each other. Um, unfortunately, the technology hasn't perfected itself yet because they haven't been able to figure out a UV pattern. And here you're looking at an example of a glass pattern designed by a company called Arnold Glass. It's called Mikado. 
the pattern that you can faintly see is actually a very iridescent pattern for the birds to see. Unfortunately, when it's placed on the inside surface of glass, again, it, doesn't, it, it renders itself pretty much useless. The problem with not putting an ultraviolet coating on the outside is because the exposure to the elements fade that pattern very quickly. So technology has to improve to be able to withstand UV treatments being placed on the outside surface of glass. I'm not gonna get into this. This is a really complicated formula. I'm gonna skip this particular slide and give you a little bit of background about how this research has been conducted to understand how it works. The first uh, sample you see in front here is uh, how they test bird collision deterrent markers on glass. Uh, it's a flight tunnel with the American Bird Conservancy. They place markers at one end of the tunnel. They released, uh, they released misted birds, misnetted birds on the other end. The birds fly through a dark tunnel and half the glass is treated, the other half of the glass is not. They count how often the bird goes right or left to determine the, bird, the uh, marker's effectiveness. The other pattern, the other uh, test methodology is, is out of the Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania, where they have these feeding stations set up. And it just uh, aside from those feeding station, stations are various panels of glass treated with different markers. And they count the number of birds that actually collide with those given markers. Now between those two test methods, the, the field study you see here is far more accurate in terms of determining how effective those markers are. The problem is this particular technique takes birds' lives and industry gravitates toward this method, even though it's less effective because there's fewer birds killed in its, in its uh, methodology. So what we're trying to do is develop a new methodology that doesn't even have to expose a bird to a strike, doesn't even have to expose a bird to uh, anything in, in, that could harm it, um, but is far more effective than these two methodologies put together. That's down the road though. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of change that you're seeing here. Uh, back in 2009, uh, Platt partnered with the city of Toronto and we developed the first set of what we call bird-friendly development guidelines. Since then, there have been cities across North America that have used the Toronto guidelines as a template to adopt similar approaches in their cities. Uh, since 2009, the City of Toronto has revisited its, its original set of guidelines and have now released their bird-friendly glass best practices. Um, most recently, the City of Ottawa, we were fortunate enough to be a part of the team that helped put guidelines together for the City of Ottawa. It's the most recent city to adopt guidelines for their city. Now, the City of Toronto has also made it mandatory for new construction. Any new buildings, less single family dwellings, are now responsible to meet a, a bare minimum requirement for bird friendly. Now the interesting thing about this, this change is it was very much at first resisted because it, it was interpreted that in the mind's eye of the architect and the developer, um, it was thought that doing what we were recommending to make glass visible to bird would interfere with the architectural integrity, the beauty and the freedom of creativity in the design of these buildings. As soon as it became mandatory and they started following these rules, they realized this ain't so bad. In fact, we're starting to see architects create buildings that are bird friendly, not necessarily because they want to be bird safe. They love the aesthetics that are now being introduced as a result of taking this approach. So what was thought to be a threat is now becoming actually more popular in architectural design. Now, what are the various products and techniques out there one can consider adopting uh, and putting on their windows? For when it comes to retrofits and even new building design, window film is by far the most common uh, technique approach used to uh, uh, either retrofit or meet mandatory requirements for new construction. You're looking at an image here of a window film treatment that had a beautiful, beautiful aesthetic pattern on it that was also designed to meet the criteria to reduce bird strikes. Uh, fricking, which they bake patterns right into the glass. This is a library out at uh, University of British Columbia where they etched into the glass of, library window, of a library window famous quotes from books. So again, an interesting aesthetic choice. 
There's digital printing and etching in glass. Again, all first surface treatments. Painting on windows is uh, another technique. There's, there's now uh, paints that last for months, if not years, on glass surfaces, allowing the individual to change up their, their patterns if they wish. Uh, exterior sun shields and blinds, um, purchased for both homeowners and commercial structures. Exterior grill work, incredible designs coming out, again, to meet not only security and safety, but make windows a, a more uh, bird friendly. Um, hanging ribbons and cables in front of windows, very, very pro various products and techniques offer this for both homeowners and commercial structures. And silk screening on glass. All these techniques are now accessible, specifically designed and incorporated to reduce bird strikes with windows. Now, how did on earth is it that all of a sudden what wasn't available less than 10 years ago is now readily available for both new and existing buildings? It came out of this two precedent setting lawsuits the first of which that took place in 2010. But before 2010, FLAP participated in a pilot project in the city of Markham, where they applied the first of its kind commercial grade window treatment designed to reduce bird strikes. This is at 8100 Warden in the city of Markham. They had a bad collision problem there. This particular treatment, first time ever, almost entirely eliminated this problem. In 2010, the first of two precedent setting lawsuits took place. FLAP was a key witness in both of these trials where we had our data uh, used to demonstrate how severe the problem was. The first being uh, Menke's developments being held to task for, task for bird death taking place at their concilium place location at McCowan and 401. We were picking up anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 birds a year just from this facility alone. Midway through the trial, they applied the first pattern of its kind, this case being a dotted pattern, um, to try and appease the courts. And since then, we've seen close to an 80% reduction in bird strikes as a result of the introduction of these markers. The second trial took place at Cadillac, with Cadillac Fairview at their Young Corporate Center location. Same scenario, midway through the trial, they applied bird deterrent markers, the same ones that were applied at, at Concilium Place, and again, an incredible reduction of bird death, uh, in bird death took place as a result of the introduction of these markers at their facility. The third, uh, sorry, the second trial uh, also enacted a law. Now, this is, this is a fascinating law. It is now technically illegal to harm or kill a bird as a result of a collision with a window. This was a result of experts sitting on the stand during the Cadillac Fairview trial that were able to demonstrate that once daylight reflects off of a glazed surface, namely glass, it's reflected in the form of radiation. Now under the Environmental Protection Act, there is a section dedicated to contaminants where anyone who emits a contaminant that harms or kills a migratory bird and aren't demonstrating an effort to mitigate that threat can be held accountable under the law. Under the list of those contaminants is radiation. So this is how they managed to piggyback on an existing law to include bird collisions as illegal activity under the Environmental Protection Act. Now, to kind of take the next step and kind of give you a, a quick snapshot in history here, as I mentioned, uh, back in 2009, first being drafted in 2010, we re released the Bird Friendly Development Guidelines, which in turn um, became mandatory for the City of Toronto in 2010. We had the two precedent setting lawsuits that took place with the introduction of the law uh, being, coming into place in 2013. And then the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks hired the Canadian Standards Association. They hired the Canadian Standards Association because they didn't know how on earth they were going to enforce a law that technically everybody's breaking. So with this standard, with the CSA, it is a voluntary standard for the province of Ontario for any municipality to adopt. What we're doing is we're trying to get the building code, the provincial building code 
to adopt this law. If the building code adopts this law, it becomes mandatory for the province. Once it becomes mandatory for the province of Ontario, it will become little by little mandatory for Canada because what tends to happen is once one building code picks up a code, the others tend to follow. So this is, this is our sort of method to our madness here. Now, kind of going in a little bit of a different direction here for your own interest, uh, Flap developed uh, a do-it-yourself app. What this app does is it allows an individual by answering a series of some 22, I think 23 different questions, it tells you what threat level your window is. And we recommend that any window that falls under the high risk to lethal range in order to respect the law under the province and federally, I will add, across the country, and I didn't mention that, and I should mention that, it is actually illegal for the entire country to harm or kill a migratory bird as a result of a collision, but it has to be a listed species to qualify. So we created this app in an effort to help a building owner a building operator decide which of their windows they should treat in order to meet the law and also to just simply save birds lives. So you can download that app. It's at uh, that the app is called flapapp.ca. So www.flapapp.ca and um, try it. Try it at your home, your workplace, wherever you want. Okay. Uh, it's there for that purpose. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always get in touch with us if you have any. We also created what's called the Global Bird Collision Mapper. I would encourage any of you in your travels, if you ever encounter a bird collision, whether it's at your home, your cottage, your workplace, sign on to the Global Bird Collision Mapper and report this collision. It is a geomapping database for anyone anywhere around the world to enter a collision record. Uh, it's, it's relatively user-friendly. Uh, to date, we have close to 64,000 entries that have uh, taken place since we launched this particular application. And all of this is going towards giving us a deeper understanding of the issue. It helps building owners and operators understand where most of the birds are colliding around their buildings. It's, it's making it very clear how severe this problem is. So please uh, consider using it. The other thing I would ask you to do is to consider participating in our global bird rescue event. We tend to uh, um, run this within the first week of October depending on where that falls in the calendar year. In this particular case, for this year, um, it's going to be from the 27th of uh, September through to the 3rd of October. And all you do is during that week, uh, make a concerted effort for look, looking for birds that collide in your community, your home, your workplace, and enter those records into the database. Last year's uh, participants we had, um, if I'm not mistaken, let me think here, I'm trying to get the numbers straight in my mind. I think there were something like 113 different countries that participated from five continents. And uh, there were over 2,000 birds reported, no, sorry, close to 2,000 birds reported during that two week period, which doesn't sound like very much, but um, uh, it, this is a program we want, this is our third year running it. It's growing bigger and bigger every year. So your participation in this would be greatly appreciated. Um, just a few other tidbits of information if you're interested. Uh, we presently have an online petition that you can sign to, to encourage the province, uh, the building code, to embrace the CSA standard. There's well over 10,000 uh, signatures so far. We're trying to get as many as we can. The other thing, just for your own matter of interest, is we've created something called a bird crash bot. This is what they call a Twitter bot. What it does is Anytime someone tweets, a bird just hit my window or something along those lines, like a bird you know, struck my window or has collided with my window, the Twitter bot picks up that tweet and it immediately retweets that person with tips and education on how to prevent that bird collision from happening again and how to help that bird they found that collided with the window. Since this has been launched in May, there's been close to 11,000 tweets from just people randomly mentioning to their family or friend that a bird just struck a window. Um, and then there's, you probably are aware of this, but uh, the BirdCast uh, now uh, is a very popular tool for monitoring bird migration. 
we use this tool to help us prepare for what will inevitably be a busy day the next day so that we have, we're more prepared with our volunteers to be on the street. Um, I, I'm kind of uh, preaching to the converted here, but I close on this slide because it's so important we understand why we, we protect these birds. Um, again, these birds we pick up, they are major contributors to controlling our insect populations. They pollinate our plants, they distribute seeds, they provide, provide food for other forms of wildlife. That aside, the bird watching industry, as you know, is huge. Bird watching is all levels from the avid birder with binoculars and bird books to having a bird feeder in your backyard. It, it generates so much money, which helps us in our economy. So all these reasons combined, we need to really take this seriously because without these birds, we're in a lot of trouble. And on that note, this is where I close. Um, any information, uh, we have several websites, uh, uh, flap.org, uh, the bird mapper I've already mentioned, uh, birdsafe.ca, we're on all forms of social media. Um, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and uh, whether you want to find out more information or um, you might even be interested in um, uh, just uh, volunteering for the organization itself, okay? And on that, I will turn off, I'll leave it at that. Oh good, I'm already off the video. There we go. Michael, that... Um, so I'm hoping there might be a few questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much for all of that information. Um, I have, I usually am jotting things down as people are, are delivering these talks so that I can get a first couple questions um, going while people are entering some things into the Q&A function down below or into the chat. So I encourage um, folks who are watching to do that right now. Um, so I guess part of me wondered, you know, what other like-minded organizations are working with you or who else is out there, whether it's provincially or nationally or globally, like are, are there any other groups who you think are doing similar things to you? Oh boy, <laughs> there are a lot of organizations now and I, I'm, FLAP partners with a lot of organizations. Uh, examples would be uh, Birds Canada, uh, Nature Canada, uh, Ontario Nature. Um, we're now uh, partnering um, uh, with Cape May, um, Cornell University of Ornithology. Um, there's, there's all these FLAP-like initiatives that have popped up all over North America, many of which we've helped train from individual Audubon chapters with their Lights Out programs to there's a new group uh, in Calgary called the Calgary Migratory Species Response Team. They're now out in the streets looking for birds during migration. Uh, there's Safe Wings Ottawa in the city of Ottawa. It's unbelievable um, the amount of, of interest and support um, that is now out there. It wasn't easy getting to this point. <laughs> Um, for the longest time, you know, we were thought of a bunch of crazy people running around with nets in our hand, picking up birds. But uh, I, I just was entirely convinced that this issue was far bigger than we realized. Um, and it was only through partnerships with other organizations, you know, collaborating and um, uh, doing various studies that we realize that this this issue is is just out of control and um, thank goodness all all these individuals and government agencies are now stepping up to the plate to help. Um, Daphne Payne asked specifically do you have any comparable groups in Hamilton or is there anyone in this Hamilton study area that you're right. working with? Uh, in Hamilton no, um, I, I've worked, I've done uh, um, what I call some building assessments um, for uh, the Hamilton Conservation Authority. Um, I've done uh, assessments for the um, Fort Erie. Um, I know that the city of Burlington does have 
uh, voluntary standards in place for bird friendly. Um, I, not, they're not standards and voluntary guidelines in place for bird friendly. But um, there's, no, there's no formal organization rooted in your region that's doing this. We get a lot of reports from members of the public that find birds that have collided with their homes or their workplace, but they're not out, out there actively looking for these birds. They're just one-off reports. Um, I was just I was just made mention of um, the bird friendly cities um, initiative as started by Nature Canada and how um, that is is one yeah. angle. Can you speak to that relationship or, or is it a partnership at this stage? Yes. Yeah. Flap has uh, taken on the role in the partnership specifically related to bird collisions. Um, bird cities, it's just sort of at its infant stages right now. They're, they're getting their feet wet and uh, they're, they're looking at the broad picture of bird conservation in their efforts. Um, but it's inevitable that as they pursue this, that they're going to find the bird collision issue is going to be uh, very much um, uh, of interest by these different municipalities across the country. Um, in part, because of this law that's now been introduced, but there's so many um, standards now popping up in all these different cities that in many cases, cities will already be getting a little check mark for bird cities uh, because they're, they're making efforts, at least in the bird collision uh, um, issue area. Okay. Um, I have some questions specific to um, to to windows specifically. So Debbie and or Dennis wants to know, how does the film adhere to the windows and how long do they last? Right. Okay, uh, this is all, uh, this is a perfect example of supply and demand. Um, the technology for first surface window films was not a, a necessity like it has become specifically because of the bird collision issue. Um, as you heard in my presentation, the only way to really uh, have a marker work effectively is in part by having it on the outside surface of glass, but many of the technologies uh, before the 2013 um, uh, ruling that came out in the courts didn't have the sophistication. But now there's all these uh, uh, window films that have six, eight, even 10 year warranties on them. Now to put this into perspective, uh, even though people might be reluctant, oh, eight, eight, let's say it's eight years, oh gosh, that's not very long. Well, guess what? The windows that you have in your homes, their warranties last about eight to 10 years. And the reason they do that is, um, a, a thermal pane window, the most common thing for a thermal pane window is the seals go. You might even see this from time to time where the windows fog up. That's because vapors now got in between the thermal pane. That's where they have the majority of their warranties. So um, a window film now lasts, they're incredibly sophisticated. In fact, the 2012 trial that took place at uh, Concilium, at Concilium Place, that window film is the original window film. You can go see it yourself. It's brand new looking. It's still sticking up there. And the way it works is it isn't a transparent window film with a marker printed on it. It's actually, those are individual dots that actually stick to the window. Now it doesn't have to be dots. It can be anything you want it to be, right? You can get custom patterns cut in these films very easily. But the dotted pattern has become so popular because it's one of the least visually obtrusive. Um, in fact, at Concilium Place, one of the concerns of the building owners and operators was that it was gonna make their building look awful. So under the pressures of going to court, they reluctantly put up these window films. They put a damage control program in place to deal with all the complaints they were anticipating to get from their tenants and their, their partners and, you know, members of the public. Up goes the window film. They didn't hear a single complaint. So they instead did a random interview of their tenants. What do you think about the markers on our windows? Their answer was, 
foot markers. They didn't even notice them. <laughs> so all these years of resisting that whatever we were suggesting was going to make their building look god awful, their tenants didn't even know what went up. So it's a mind's eye perspective that was resisting this whole thing. And now, as I said, with architects, they're, they're actually seeing this as an opportunity to be more creative by making these markers available, right? I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but I thought I'd better mention that before I didn't mention it, okay? You know, that's a good segue into a question asked by Candy. Have you approached architecture schools to speak on this and or associations, or are they spreading the word among themselves? It's both. Um, we, we do lots of presentations to uh, architectural students, um, to architectural firms, lots of lunch and learns. Um, but what's really interesting is now that this is sort of caught on locally, um, architects, our, Toronto architects are now getting jobs in the city of Ottawa. Um, they're, they're up in Barrie, they're, they're out in your neck of the woods getting jobs for new construction. And they're just making it part of their efforts to say, hey, look, you don't have to do this because there's no requirements in your region, but I'd recommend you at least consider it. Um, I'll give a great example of that. There was a brand new library built out at Trent University in Peterborough. In, yeah, in Peterborough. Um, that entire building has bird collision deterrent markers on it which had nothing to do with meeting a requirement in Peterborough. It had to do with the architect being a Toronto architect that convinced their client they should make their windows bird safe. So this is, this is the way of the future. And, um, and I, I know this is, a, this is a real exciting thing for, for FLAP because I really believed in my lifetime, I'd be long gone from this planet before we'd even come close to seeing the progress being made uh, in this issue. Um, and uh, I'm just so glad we're over this hurdle. There's still a long way to go here, but um, we're really past that hump now. And, um, but all that being said, that is very much from the new construction angle. When it comes to existing buildings, that's where it's still very difficult. And quite frankly, that's where 99.99% .99 of birds are dying. It isn't at these new buildings. It's just a volume-based issue. There are far more existing buildings out there than there are new builds. So we all have a role here. We all have to take this issue seriously. We have to do everything we can at our homes, our cottages, and our workplaces, the existing locations to really address this issue, okay? And that's where a few of these next questions come okay. from, and some are kind of similar. So I'll, I'll read off one who comes from Tailwind42. Great presentation, thank you. I have 24 windows and apply UV leaves on the outside of my windows as deterrents that I replace every spring. This gets quite yeah. costly, so I appreciate other yeah. options that will last longer. Can you recommend a particular company or two? Yes, okay. Um, just very quickly about those UV decals. That's a perfect example of uh, a product that was originally thought to be achieving um, the perfect fit. Those UV decals are technically supposed to be invisible to our eye, or at least very difficult for us to see, but the birds see it. The UV reflective quality of that product doesn't meet the requirement, not the requirement, doesn't meet the formula of uh, what they call nanometer wavelengths of UV reflectivity that birds can actually see. That's problem number one. Number two, the UV treatment they put on those vinyl fil films fade after a short period of time anyway. Number three, in order to, for that to work properly, you have to buy enough of decals to cover your entire window to meet that five centimeter by five centimeter spacing. Extremely costly, extremely labor intensive to do over and over and over again. So um, there is a company um, out of Etobicoke called Feather Friendly Technologies. They're the one that's producing that dotted pattern. Um, to give you an example from what I understand, 
a single roll of this tape that you can purchase right off their website for, I think, $18 shipped to your home, it will treat a patio sliding door unit. That's a lot of area of glass for 18 bucks. <laughs> it's relatively easy to install. Um, and again, the, the film itself, uh, if you install it properly, which is very easy to install, um, has about an eight year warranty on it. It'll live longer than that. Uh, it'll last longer than that, I should say. So that's example number one. The other one is called uh, Acopian Bird Savers. Uh, they are, they hang what's called parachute cord from the top of your window. It's, it's stuck on by Velcro and these parachute cords hang four inches apart from each other um, or 10 centimeters apart from each other. And they hang in front of the entire row of glass. The cost of those I think are something like, well actually if they're a custom size, but if, to treat a sliding door unit, I think it's about 22 or 24 dollars. The difference between those two techniques is one is fastened directly to the window itself, the other hangs in front of the window. Um, both have very high success rates of reducing bird strikes. So those are good ones to do. And in the case of the uh, Elkopian Bird Saver, you can do the very same technique on your own. You don't have to buy a coping bird saver. In fact, if you go to their website, they even encourage you to build it on your own <laughs> rather than buy it from them. So, um, and it's so cost effective. You just have to have stuff around the house to make it with, right? But just make sure the spacing is done properly. What, what is the name of that? Are you saying a copian? What, what is it, sorry? Correct, a copian bird saver. Now, all these are listed on our website, by the way. Um, if you go to either our flap.org website or birdsafe.ca, we have a section dedicated to homeowners and commercial buildings. Each will point to these techniques and others, for that matter, that you can, uh, you can try at your own home, okay? So, uh, so D Dale asks, I purchased a peak visor permanent marker at Lee Valley and drew two inch vertical lines on the bay window. It works great. How can I protect the upper windows? I'm a bit nervous to climb up that high. Yeah, this is a problem. Um, you know, and, and it, this comes up a lot for us because let's face it, a, a lot of people, you know, especially with the elderly, they're not gonna be climbing a ladder to put up markers in front of their windows. So, you know, they might be saving birds' lives, but they might end up taking their life in, in an effort to do so, right? So um, unfortunately, there isn't a magic fix to that. Uh, it really does entail getting up there and putting something on or in front of those windows. Um, and what we always recommend um, is look to small businesses in your community, like window cleaners, that might, might and have in some cases been willing to come out and at a cost, hang or apply these very deterrent uh, techniques that I'm talking about, um, or you know, get, get the local teenager in your community, you know, give them 20 bucks to go out one Saturday afternoon and put it in front of that window that you know birds are gliding on, on that you can't quite access on your own, right? Um, there's always a way to do it, but if you're concerned about doing it yourself, then there's, there's other people out there that would be willing to do it, even at a voluntary level if, you, if they were kind enough. Um, that is a really great idea, you know, like, yeah, use, use someone who's already kind of working at those heights to just tweak their role a little bit. That's cool. Um, yeah. Candy, and I'm trying to make sense of this question, just wondering if a screen has been used on windows cut from frosted plexi with a CNC machine or stretched silicone using spacers or suckers to keep it a few inches away from the glass so birds see it and bounce off. So I guess it's an external. Wow. Yeah, um, I'm trying to picture what you're suggesting there. Uh, you're saying like a frosted plexiglass that is in some shape or form cut into a pattern that would be placed on in front of that entire panel of glass. I can't say specifically plexiglass, but um, I know that things like um, uh, window screens themselves um, and then by the way, I'll, I'll make, I should point this out. 
if you have screens in front of your windows, don't take them on. Leave them up year round because screens have been known to help reduce strikes. Um, don't clean your windows, and a lot of people don't, but the more debris that builds on the glass surface um, has been known to help mute reflection a little bit. It's not perfect. It's still better to actually apply markers to your windows if you can, but that, but that does help as well. But uh, again, uh, without really, I, I can't say I'm quite familiar with the technique that's being described there. I'd like to see it, better understand it. And, you know, if you can send me a picture, uh, I'd love to see it, to see if I can give you a better input than I'm able to at this moment. Thank you. Um, Mallory says, pertaining to collisions with vehicles, are there any preventative measures that can be implemented to help reduce fatal encounters? Are there certain vehicle colors that have a higher strike rate? Any thoughts to that? Wow. Um, there isn't any evidence that would suggest the color of vehicles are more vulnerable than others. There is with light. Um, uh, the blue spectrum versus the red spectrum, and I think, I think the red spectrum is less attractive to a bird, nocturnal migrating bird, than the blue spectrum is. The blues and greens are. But for daytime vehicle strikes, yeah, I, I, I know nothing. I haven't read anything that would suggest the color of the vehicle makes the difference. And, and you know, we, we get asked quite often these very questions. And, uh, you know, the bulk of our effort, I, I think it's really important for, for your uh, viewers to understand. Uh, FLAP is, we're made up of three staff. I'm one of them. And um, we wear far too many hats. We're trying, we're, we're getting a heck of a lot done with just three staff, but I wish we could focus on vehicle strikes, wind turbines, power lines, you know, any form of human caused bird death, um, but we just don't have the resources to do it, right? So vehicles come up from time to time and what limited research we've been able to find on it is there really isn't anything there that we can see genuinely helps reduce strikes. That they, they thought those, uh, those uh, bumper whistles, you know, those high pitch frequency devices uh, uh, that really were originally designed for deer um, to reduce vehicle collisions with deer do nothing to reduce bird strikes. Um, so <laughs> this is gonna sound crazy, but the best way to reduce fatal strikes with a bird is you just drive slow. And obviously that can happen, especially depending on where you're driving, right? So what that tells us is there's a lot of research in that that itself needs to happen in order to, to know how to prevent these kinds of strikes from occurring. Awesome, and you're right. I mean, the three of you and your and volunteers, I mean, you're already doing so much work. So um, any of these answers that you're providing are great. And I only have a couple more questions for you. And two, these two are kind of government related. So Neil wants to know with the present pro-development provincial government, how do you think you will be able to change building codes, et cetera? Right. Well, you may have all heard by now, um, but the liberal government uh, has sort of fallen into a lap a little bit um, in that they're proposing to put a great fourth of effort towards climate change. Um, and this is very much a part of what we are directly and indirectly addressing because here we are, we're, we're trying to save birds by turning lights off. Um, at the same time, you save energy, you're gonna help reduce climate change. Um, during the day, we're, we're proposing uh, printing on transparent film as a retrofit on buildings and new construction for that matter, that is solar reflective films designed to reduce cooling costs. Again, save energy, you're gonna save on, on climate change. Um, with this, um, we're gonna to go to the provincial building code because this climate change, you watch, climate change is gonna fall into the laps of the building code as well. And this is gonna give us more leverage to convince the building code that they should be adopting the CSA standard. So um, we're gonna try this out. It's only gonna help us, it's not gonna hinder us. And uh, again, it's gonna give us uh, more power to hopefully see this become a reality. 
in terms of uh, the Berkeley initiative being embraced. That's that's great. I mean, we all know that um, you know there are certain angles or loopholes that some entities take um, because they can, and if there's a couple of different uh, dominoes that can yeah. fall, you know, in favor of the birds, in favor of those working towards it, then then great. Um, this might be a little out of your realm, yeah. but uh, Bruce wants to know. Uh, I would like to ask about the amount of money that birders spend. Provincial government does not seem to recognize what birders spend. Do you happen to have any idea on any of that data by any chance? Right. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of the Wild West when it comes to that figure. At least that's what we're finding. But if, if you think about it, um, as I mentioned, it isn't just about what we would call an avid birder. Um, but if we talk about an average birder contributing uh, in terms of money, you know, just think of Point Peely. It isn't just going there with your binoculars and looking at the birds. There are people that travel from all over the country, all over the world, to visit Point Peely. That one little piece of landscape there. And while they're here, they're, they're staying in hotels, they're, they're renting cars, they're eating in restaurants, they're buying touristy things, they're doing touristy activities. Um, that goes into our economy. But look at bird feeding industry. If you think about it, you, you can go into a big box store, you can go into a hardware store, into a grocery store, even a corner store. And of all the products they can be selling, I guarantee you, one of it's going to be bird seed because it just flows off the shelf. People People buy it all the time. So I don't have a figure for you, but I can promise you it's a huge chunk of money that is going back into the economy through the bird watching industry. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see how these numbers evolve through time because um, uh, more and more people are becoming interested in the birds. This pandemic, just to give you an example, um, we have found that because of the pandemic, we weren't ready for this. We are getting all kinds of calls now from homeowners. Birds are hitting my windows. What do I do about it, right? And it's not like this has all of a sudden started to happen because of the pandemic. It's because people are at home now. They're there seeing it happen. You talk to Feather Friendly Technologies, their sales have quadrupled since the pandemic began, because people are now looking for solutions at their homes, right? Yes. Which is, a, it's kind of weird to say that a pandemic has done good here, <laughs> but in terms of this issue, it really has opened people's eyes to this issue, right? And it's, it's, it's creating industry. It's going, again, it's, you watch, there's gonna be other companies pop on the landscape that's gonna be manufacturing bird collision deterrent products, and all that generates money. Right? So this is a good thing. This is a good place for us to be. And kind of like you said, you know, looking back on the work you've been doing, you've, you know, you didn't, you didn't know when you would get over a certain hump and now you have, and now that allows you to hopefully start looking at the, and then what, or what's next, which is great. And the last question we have here from Sandy, yeah. um, do you have data on whether collisions are falling in number? Right. On a percentage scale, there's just not enough, um, enough volume there for us to get a sense of, of a, a true decline in collisions. There's just not a, enough, especially when the vast majority of bird death is occurring at existing buildings, and they're the ones that are the tougher sell. Um, especially uh, at the commercial structure level, right? So, and, and this is why the law is so important. I mean, FLAP's philosophy for years, leading up to the early 2000s, was volunteerism, 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 volunteerism. And then I just, I, I hit a brick wall at, at, at realizing one day that this, this is not going any further. The only way for this kind of change to take place is enforcement, period. 
people will just not do this unless they absolutely have to do something about it. Sure, you're going to get a few that sympathize and they're going to, they're going to go the distance, but they're few and far apart. So um, uh, unfortunately, it does take the law enforcement here to really get this issue under control. Yeah, I guess if you've if you've only been working on it for so long as well, you don't really know kind of where the collisions have been from, you know, before you started taking the data until where it is now. I think, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, just keep at it forever more, you know, like uh, it'd be great to be able to prove if numbers would be able to fall. But if you were, if you, if, if the plan is just like, you know, regardless, even if we have no reports in one year, we want to make sure that people are still doing this year after year. Um, and like you said, if it does take some enforcement. Well, so but, something important to point out here. Yeah. Um, something important to point out, when the trial came out uh, and the verdict came out about the law, all of a sudden, we were getting calls from glass fabricators and window manufacturers and environmental consultants all wanting our knowledge because they saw the opportunity now that there's money to be made in this, right? And, uh, and I'm all for that. I'm all for that. If people get rich over this, fantastic. Let, let them get rich, right? Um, but um, again, uh, as long as the ministry isn't prepared to enforce the law, the law is useless. So uh, we, we, I think this is one thing I'll, I'll just close on. If everyone can really, um, really take this seriously in terms of tr helping turn this around and do what you can in your community to impress you know, the city of Hamilton, to do what the city of Toronto has done, do what the city of Mississauga and the city of Markham and the city of Vaughan all now having mandatory requirements in place for new builds, right? Um, the more municipalities that embrace this, it's going to make it easier for the building code to embrace it, right? Because they're, they're clearly demonstrating there's a majority out there that are willing to do this. So get the city of Hamilton uh, on board would be great. Um, even better, don't hesitate to speak up to the provincial building code about this. And, um, you know, give your two cents for it. And one way of doing that is sign our petition. Sign the petition on change.org and um, uh, add, add your signature to it. All this helps, okay? And last, my, my last question for you is what, what does 2021 look like for you, for Michael or for FLAP? You know, what are some, what are some goals that perhaps you're hoping to achieve or, or you know, what are, some, what are some things that we could look forward to, to seeing from you guys? Right. So uh, front and center, the primary goal is, is the building code, quite frankly. Um, we're, we're also quite keen to continue helping other flat-like initiatives uh, grow and flourish in their cities. Because uh, the, more, the more groups out there doing what we do, the more common this issue becomes to people, right? So that, that's always going to be front and center for us. We're also developing this partnership with Cornell University of Ornithology where we're trying to create um, a united database. Right now, there is an abundance of bird collision data all across North America, but they're all in these little pockets of different groups collecting birds in their community, but no one wants to surrender this data to anybody because there's this sense of ownership. There's this sense of, uh, if they give away the data, it's almost like giving their, their identity away. They're losing control of that data, right? So we're trying to develop uh, a united database for every group to use, all collectively use and input into, um, because you'll be blown away at the numbers that start to surface if everyone's pooling that information together. And, um, and it will make, it'll send a very powerful message to government agencies that this is, this, is, this is a big problem that has to be paid attention to. So, so the database is something we also plan to work on in 2021. That's incredible. I, I, uh, I, I commend you for, for where this first started and where you have taken it and 
where you will take it. I mean, it, you've you've been doing tremendous work already. You know the the. Uh, what were you calling it? Sorry, where you place the birds in, you know, in out front of certain centers? There's a name for that. Oh, yeah. our annual bird layout. It's a very dull name, but uh, we 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 do it at the Royal Ontario Museum. And listen, if you ever get a chance, if we're ever fortunate enough to go out there and do this again, um, you you have to check this out. Um, it, it's such a powerful moment for people. You know, it, people that just go to the ROM because they want to go to the ROM, right? And they happen to stumble across this exhibit. Many people, that's as far as they go that night. They stay in this room to just awe of this layout, right? Because they're just so taken by it. And seeing some of these birds that they didn't even realize existed in this country, lying there dead by the thousands in front of them, it just blows people away, right? Yeah. And so um, this is why we're just going to keep on doing it. Uh, this yeah. coming year, we're actually going to do it virtually. We're, we're in a position because of COVID that we're preparing to do it virtually. And just so you know, the concept there is that we're going to invite all groups that do what we do to collectively do a live feed so that all these groups are doing it together at the same time. And people, members of the public will be able to tune in and see these individual layouts grow over that given hour um, as part of an educational effort. That's, yeah, that, I was kind of leading into that about how powerful seeing something like that is. And if it takes, if it takes that, you know, kind of slap in the face to have people realize just that kind of impact that we're having. I mean, you know, we're the cause of so much of the decline of the natural world that if, that if, you know, they, people can understand and see that there are folks like yourself and just everyday people who are able to make those changes. Um, that must feel good for you, but it feels better for the greater good of it all. So, Michael, on behalf of the of the Hamilton Naturalist Club, to those who are here tonight or who might see down the road, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to talk to us and to just share all of your efforts with us. Um, and best of luck to you um, for the rest of this year and going forward. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to chat with anyone who's willing to listen. <laughs> so thank you for having me. And we'd, we'd be happy to have you back again at a later date as well. Um, so enjoy the rest of your evening. And to the folks still in the space tonight, um, you as well, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your night. Um, and we'll either see you collecting uh, some specimens with Mark Peck on the 18th of January, or we'll see you right back here for the talk about Atlas 3. So, Michael, good night. Everybody, enjoy your evening. We'll see you again.